Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello. Welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on thinktechhawaii.com. So glad you've joined us today. I am here with Christy Hong and Erica Antalon. Antalon, sorry, I always get that one right. I didn't want to, I didn't want to introduce you, but say it the wrong way. From the Domestic Violence Action Center, and it is so wonderful to have them here today with us. And we are going to watch in the very beginning here a little video that I got to make at the Domestic Violence Action Center and some of the programs that they've got available for survivors and for victims out there. So if anybody needs something, this is the place to come for sure. If you would roll that footage for us, that'd be great. This job of addressing domestic violence is uh, much, much bigger than we are. And there's a role for every sector to play. Our healthcare, our business, our elected leaders, everybody uh, in their way can join us and be a part of the journey to bring peace to uh, island families. You may uh, think it doesn't have anything to do with you. Um, close your eyes for one moment and uh, Think about your community and uh, know that in your community domestic violence is impacting somebody, a co-worker, a neighbor, a family member. We started as a very, very small agency in 1990 with two part-time staff. There are now uh, 52 of us. My name is Chelsea Stewart. I am a campus survivor advocate for the Windward and Honolulu Community College campuses. The victim or survivor could be a student, faculty, or any other staff member. So, you know, everyone assumes that domestic violence and intimate partner violence is just physical, but there's so many more non-physical aspects as well. So, um, you know, it could include like financial, emotional abuse, as well as physical and sexual abuse as well. Some of the services that that I do include um, core accompaniment. Um, I do a lot of safety planning every day with, with people that I interact with. Um, you know, some people have more dire needs than others. Sometimes I work with police often, um, you know, help my clients get restraining orders from the courts. Um, sometimes I just help them make sure that, you know, they're getting scholarships or, you know, helping them get different forms of financial aid. There's definitely a need, you know, anyone could be a victim of domestic violence. You know, a lot of people assume that victims, uh, you know, they're, they're poor, um, they, they don't work, they don't have any education, but that's not the case at all. Anyone could be a victim and it'd be surprising to see the need for our services um, in the university systems. And like I said, not just, it doesn't affect just students, 
but there are a lot of people that work for the universities as well that do need the help and support. I'm Wendy. I'm an Olakai advocate here at the Domestic Violence Action Center. Um, I work primarily with adults um, ages 22 and up. We, um, I had one client just recently. She was an immigrant, very young. Uh, the first time I met her, she came in eyes puffy, scared, worried, um, distraught. And uh, she was new to the island. She didn't have any support system. She didn't have a place to stay because her abuser took all of that away from her. So we worked with her. We worked with her on getting her safety. We worked with her on um, getting financial help, medical. Uh, we even taught her how to catch the bus here <laughs> because her, um, her abuser didn't want her to know how. I'm Lydia Pavon and uh, I manage the advocacy program of this agency and I've been here for 13 years. When I was in the Philippines, I grew up witnessing my mom being abused by my father. So when I was still in the Philippines, I had always been saying I want to be an advocate without really knowing what it meant. And when I came to Hawaii, I found the ad for an advocate in this agency. I immediately applied and here I am. So in the span of 12 years that I have helped, say, 100 clients, and everybody's praying for me, then that's a blessing. I just hope that uh, domestic violence is not just a personal thing or a private thing, that it is the moral obligation of every member of society to help, because it affects the whole society as a whole. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to read a statistic and you guys are going to let us know if you think the statistic is true or if you think it's false, okay? Yes. Sound good? Yeah, like okay, right. ready? Who wants to read the first one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> President or something. About 20% of high school students in Hawaii report being controlled or emotionally hurt over the past 12 months. Alright, what do you guys think? Is that true or is that false? False. If a student was to come up to us on the spot, we can provide brief advocacy and information, resources, things like that. We do have our teen advocate cachet who also um, works you know, one on one with folks who are being abused ages 12 to 21. Um, it's not as maybe on the spot as the Safe Unseen program is because you know teens basically reach out for support in crisis. And so it, it might be abusive, but they don't feel like it's as crucial in the moment to get the that sort of advice and support. But when things do get, you know, dramatic and violent, then, you know, a lot of times that's when they're needing the help. I mean, one really important thing I think about TAP is that we take teen relationships serious. Um, we did put together a toolkit recently um, with the, the headline, Young Love is Real Love. And we like to, you know, give the students the hope that they can be in healthy relationships. They can help each other out. They can be supportive to one another. And they can also help prevent violence in their communities. And that it needs to start on that level um, so that we can have adults in the future who, are, who know how to properly treat each other as well. I'm Erica. I'm the LGBTQ plus advocate uh, with DVAC. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy work, in speci specifically for the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we um, support them in any way possible in, in regards to helping them overcome their trauma or work and working with them, you know, being the guiding light in that sense. And any support they may need um, through emotional needs or anything. Um, we're there for them. One more thing um, I'd like to share to the people of Oahu and uh, the community and the colleges as well. We, the people here and myself, we love what we do. We're willing to help people. Personally, I do what I do is because I'm the guiding light for those who feel like they're in the dark and they feel like they're treading water and they can't breathe in that sense so we're, we're the ones that you know will be by your side and work with you um, to give you hope and make you realize that there's hope out there for you and then you, you can um, get through what you're, what you're going through. Um, so in the end uh, she is officially divorced. Her immigration status, we're almost there, we're almost done. 
and uh, safety. The order for protection went through and I seen her yesterday. I hugged her, told her that we're, we're coming to a close soon and uh, she cried with me and I mean when I, when I seen her come in yesterday uh, she was smiling from ear to ear, radiant as can be, head held high, um, confident, really confident. Welcome back to the show. I hope you enjoyed that video. I know that I'm so impressed with all the programs that are available at DVAC and how important it is for people to understand that there are these kinds of programs available and these resources that are available. So I'm going to turn this over here to get you guys involved here instead of just the video. And you were so great in that video, Erica. I'm telling you, I loved it. My favorite part is where you turn around and go, one more thing. Absolutely love that part. But what I'd like you to do here for us now is to tell us a little bit more about um, what you do with the LGBTQ plus stuff. What's some of your uh, your best programs that work? I know we don't have, you know, an hour show. It's just yes. a half hour show. So yes. maybe pick out some of the best ones to share with us. That'd be great. Yes, yeah, so uh, within Domestic Violence Action Center, there's about nine programs. And so the LGBTQ plus um, pro advocacy program, it's a new program that just uh, started off in the fall of last year, oh, 2017. So really new. Yeah, so um, the, um, the uniqueness of that, it, it's specifically to help members who experience intimate partner violence um, um, if they're in a, any type of relationship. So intimate partner violence and domestic violence that doesn't just happen to heterosexuals as well. Right. We want to show and share with the people in the public that it also happens to LGBTQ plus individuals. Sure it does. Well, and, and like you say, I like the way you put it, intimate partner violence. Yes. Instead of just domestic violence, I think that intimate partner violence is a better description of, of what it really is and what we're dealing with. And um, to add to that with intimate partner violence, specifically with LGBTQ+, um, there is a power and control um, energy that happens with with that, and so there's a lot of power and control will out there that um, our viewers can see and what right. goes on. So, um, if you picture of a person being in the in the center, having that power and control, they exert different type of tactics and then um, show red flags about sure. unhealthy and abusive relationships, right. specifically to um, their partner if they're a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender queer questioning, pansexual, asexual allies, and so forth. Right, sure, because it's all about power and control. Yes. That's what it's always about. It's all, yes. I have a, a story that I've been working on writing for a while, and I call it the interchangeable part theory, mm -hmm. because all abusers seem to have the same interchangeable parts. Mm -hmm. They look a little different. They cross socioeconomic lines and gender lines and age lines. But they all do the same things. They control who you know, where you go, what you do. Nothing you do is good enough. Everything's always your fault. They're always sure you're cheating on them. I think it stems from a real deep, deep insecurity that's inside them, right? Yes. Um, well, I know that we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about this in just a minute because we're going to take a break. But this is Finding Respect in the Chaos on ThinkTechHawaii.com, and I really hope you will stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests, the students of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. 
Hey, aloha everybody. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, we air at 10 a.m. And we're gonna be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some, some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, security is all about people, processes, and products, and we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Hello. Welcome back. I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on thinktechhawaii.com. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. We are here today with Erica and Christy from the Domestic Violence Action Center. And, and Erica, why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of these programs? I know the definition, so now we get a better idea of what it is that your, that your program deals with. And could you give us some idea of what you kind of do, what some of the programs are? Sure, sure. So um, when, when a victim comes forward, and mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot out of a victim to come even reach out and seek help, sure. especially for individuals with LGBTQ+, because um, not only were, are they discriminated against and they're experiencing intimate partner violence, um, there's other layers in addition to abuse, discrimination that comes with it. Um, sure, I would think that society would just kind of turn a blind eye, even though because um, there's so much, like you said, discrimination yes, against exactly. that, right? In regards to that, yes. And also um, what the members of the community face, specifically LGBTQ, is the, the things about outing someone when they're not ready. Oh, right. right? Oh, I didn't even think about that, sure. Right. Um, not only that, is their, they attack also their identity. Mm. So they identify as a specific um, either a lesbian, like myself, um, and then they're discriminated against, so in regards to that, and then to add to that, being in a relationship where there is violence um, in the whole area of being either sexually abused, economically abused, psychologically, emotionally, the whole, like, nine yards. Right, and abuse. economical abuse is something yeah. that I don't think a lot of people really understand. But when someone controls your money, they control you. You can't yes. go anywhere. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think people don't quite realize how important that is. And so it, I know it's been added to the official definition of domestic violence now mm -hmm. that financial coercion is one of them, right? Yes, definitely. Financial coercion. Um, I think also mainly their identity as well. Right. That's the one that, and it, it really underlines and attacks the emotional aspect of one's being. So right. when they become victims, so for example, if, if you were a very bubbly person, confident, but once you engage into a uh, relationship that involves domestic violence, you lose a piece of yourself, your right. self-esteem, sure. your identity, and, and all that area. Right, and so your programs help people to yes. get that built back up again? Yes, our program, okay. our LGBTQ plus program helps specifically finding resources for them in regards to either um, addressing any legal matters, um, any, um, uh, if they need to find housing because their right. abuser kicked them out, um, they, they have a temporary restraining order on the victim itself, they'll, they'll try to do that as well and try to get kicked out of, the, out of the house, and then they have no place to go. Right. right? Um, so they have to resort to either living on the streets or finding resources in regards to helping them. So I know that um, some people, actually quite a few people, have issues with the temporary restraining orders, with the TROs. Is that something that's even harder for the LGBT community, too, than it is? I mean, just because it's all about the judges, and if they've got any kind of bias against that community, then they're not going to be able to get them as easily? Is, there, is that an issue at all for you guys? Um, there is an issue, and um, however, it's also very delicate. Right. But, um, so what we offer, too, is um, providing education, spreading awareness, um, right. awareness, sorry, and doing outreaches just to inform in all areas of our community, from private right. to you know public entities, to get it out there that um, 
intimate partner violence doesn't just happen um, to specific uh, population. It can happen to uh, LGBTQ plus. As right. Well. To anyone. To absolutely. Anyone. absolutely. Anyone. That's so true. Oh my gosh. Okay, Chris, you've been sitting there waiting so long, and I want to hear about about the stuff that you're doing too, because I know you're the immigrant advocate. So, and I know we've got a lot of immigrants here in Hawaii. So, um, what kind of stuff do you guys do with the immigrants there in, uh, so, in your program? So, we're part of the same new program, the Specialized Advocacy Services at DVAC. And so the service. Okay, wait, wait. Say that again. Specialized. Oh, sorry, special you said it so fast. I want to make sure everybody gets that. Uh, specialized Sorry's. Advocacy Services, SAS okay. program. Okay. And so this program came out of a need, um, realizing that these specific members of the community, LGBTQ plus and immigrants, face different kinds of challenges, different sure. kinds of barriers to reaching help. And so Erica just described sort of what barriers LGBTQ plus might face in accessing help, but immigrants also face a very complex situation. Sure. Um, and sort of we talked about the power and control wheel. So one um, major way that abusers could control and exert power over a victim is through their immigration status. Right. And so for um, a lot of victims who come into the states um, married to a U.S. citizen who is also an abuser. The abuser can exploit that situation and say, right. I'm not going to go go for the citizenship interview for you. I'm not going to file your immigration papers. Oh, yeah. um, and then, you know, um, sometimes, like, uh, victims might just stay, like, um, with undocumented status because their abusers didn't um, or said they wouldn't file for lawful immigration status for them. And that's a major way that abusers ha have used the immigration system and fear of deportation to control their victims. Sure, that's huge even yes. too, I would think. Oh my gosh, that's like in there with the financial coercion and the emotional sort of subtle stuff that's hard to stand up and say, look at my bruise, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's why people, I think, that our victims end up being silenced like that because they can't. So I. You know, I, I was abused in my marriage, and and I had the bruise to show, and I often thought, you know, about other people that don't have the bruise to show. What do they do? And when he would abuse me emotionally, same kind of thing. It's like, you can't go look at my bruise because it's not there. You're just raw on the inside. But mm -hmm. So, and I'm sure that happens for immigrants because yeah. there's... What do you do? Who do you talk to? I mean, I would imagine there's a language barrier, too. Yes, language barriers are huge, and sometimes immigrants don't know that they have access to interpreters. So if they need oh, right. to file a police report, they need to call 911, they can also ask the police to bring an interpreter or have an interpreter available to them, whether by phone. And so that's, that's a very big barrier, that, that language piece. Right. Um, and also just not knowing what rights you have as an immigrant in the States. Um, it's like, I was an immigrant, I'm, I'm an immigrant, and just, it was hard for our family to know, like, what we could do, sure. like, in terms of accessing, like, help, legal help. And I think that's also another big barrier, just not knowing whether you can call the police and what happens if, you know, you're undocumented, like, can they figure that out and then what's right. going to happen after that. So a lot of people don't seek help because they think that they, they can't access the help that they need. Right, and they um, might end up getting deported back to where they came from mm -hmm. and they don't want that. Mm -hmm. So they just get stuck and stay. Yeah. Wow. Where did your family come from? Korea. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Well, how long have you been here? I've been here since I was four, so oh. um, since I was really little. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, then you're the perfect person for this job, too, because you understand it from the inside out, right? Yeah. Just say like both of you guys are both the perfect people for your jobs <laughs> because you can really understand from a, a, a deep place instead of just the book learning. You can, I, I have found anyway in the past that um, I, could, I would go out on, on calls with my head mentor guy, and he's got the doctorate, and he's got all the stuff. But because I was you know, a fellow survivor, when I would go out, people would just instantly relate to me. And we'd be leaving, and he'd be like, how do they know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. They just know. Because you just relate. You say things differently. You feel things differently. You understand it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important for victims to know that so that they can get to be survivors, right? Yes. Yeah. Because they all start sort of as victims. Um, and then 
when they get out to the other side and they realize that they don't have to be stuck in that one day I'll be good enough syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm always saying that. Um, my biggest thing that I'm always pounding the table about is that I think we need to teach our kids, right? So if we teach them young what healthy relationships look like, then maybe in the future, like Kali'i was saying on the video, that um, maybe we'll have adults that know how to treat each other properly when it gets to that point. We might have to wait a few years, but you know, if we can just invest in it now, right? Yes. Um, I know for the schools, the high schools and stuff, the LGBTQ stuff is LGBTQ plus. I always yes. forget the plus, sorry. Yes. Um, but I know that that's a big thing in the high schools right now, yes. too, so, right? Yes, uh, so one of um, Domestic Violence Action Center's program, too, is Tap It Wait, which you've um, interviewed. So they're their only um, prevention entity that actually, you know, goes out to the schools and, and try to work with the students and, and um, display and show uh, what are healthy relationships supposed to be, as opposed to watching watching things? Um, you know, we have access to everything of that right. that is violent and shows everything, as opposed to something watching, as opposed to watching something uh, that shows uh, what is a healthy relationship that has respect, that shows you know that they love each other right. and they trust each other. Right. Those are like the three most important things even. We're almost out of time. Christy, do you have one more thing you'd like to maybe add here for the the, the immigrant stuff that, go, that you work with? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, no, there are very real barriers, but um, there are resources available. Um, yes. We have the Hawaiian Immigrant Justice Center that provides free services for immigrants to file for immigration remedies so that they don't depend on their abuser for immigration status. Um, yes. And they can educate them about what sorts of options are available for them, even though it might take a long time um, to go through the process and come out as a permanent resident or a citizen of the states, ultimately. Um, and then at DVAG, we also have connections with other resources um, for that immigrants can access and just and making sure that they connect with those and, um, and access that help, because yeah. the help is available. Wow, I'm so glad you guys came on the show today. I want to have you back, especially yes. since this is a new program, as you guys progress with it, and and I know you're going to be successful, and I just really am grateful that you guys came on. I'm grateful that you gave me the opportunity to come out to the office and, and do some filming. I want to do some more. I think it would be great. I want to partner with you guys. i got all kinds of ideas. So, I want to say thank you to everyone for coming here to join us at Finding Respect in the Chaos. We're always looking for respect, and the Domestic Violence Action Center sure does find it, without a doubt. So, I hope you'll come back and join us again on ThinkTechHawaii.com. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thanks for being here.